Hi everybody, thank you for joining me for this week's question and answer video. I'm answering your guys' questions from the last question and answer video, last Monday. I do this every Monday and I encourage all of you guys to go down below and ask me any questions you want. Come back next Monday for my answer. Let me know what you think. Let me know if I missed a question. I missed Ben's questions last week, so I'm going to answer it this time. I just remembered I told Ben first. It's last. I'm sorry, Ben. You're going to have to watch the whole video or fast forward. Um, I never thank you guys enough, and I want to thank you again very much for all your support, especially for these videos, these question and answer videos. I really enjoy doing them every week. I've been doing them for, gosh, six, seven years. Um, I don't miss them. I, don't, I never miss one. And you guys never miss the questions. And I really appreciate your guys' support. Um, I only get about 10% of you guys that watch the videos and ask me questions that are subscribed to my channel. I started all of this and I want to do this because I just want to get the information out there to people who need it. I mean, it, it could take a simple few words, an answer, just something that could really change people's lives, save it. And uh, why not try to help each other out, right? You know how lonely it felt, right? You know how you felt like no one understood you and there's no help out there. There's a lot of people like that, millions, and they need our help. So I'm doing all this that I can, and I would just need you guys just to hit a button. That's it. If, you, if you're able to watch this every week, can you just hit a like and subscribe? It does so much. It's, it's everything. And if without it, this doesn't go anywhere. And at 10%, I think we can do better than that. Let's get up to like maybe half you guys. And if you guys don't like to give likes on my video and won't subscribe to my channel, can you tell me why? Maybe I can change something to help to get, to get your guys' support. That'd be great. All right, let's get on to the questions, which are great. Always great questions. And uh, Jess P. St. Peter's from, I believe, Montana, M.O., says the fact that you say, if I missed your question, I'm sorry, not a single person that many of us have been in a relationship with can even say that. You help me understand faster healing. Thank you for being you. This is complex and traumatic. Thanks for sharing your personal story. You don't need the paperwork to understand it. You need empathy and personal experiences to understand what happened and to be able to genuinely help others. You are healing thousands of people. Thanks, David. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you very much. I was just, just thanking you guys for being so supportive. Thank you very much, Jess. I appreciate you. Thank you. Rory from Ohio. Hello, Rory. I often found myself saying to my husband, just who do you think you are? After he berated someone or acted like a jerk or an a-hole, he would look at me bewildered. How can they be so arrogant? Your Q&As are really appreciated. Well, they don't look at themselves. That's the problem. They don't see themselves. They don't look at themselves. They don't introspect. They aren't very humble, no humility. They don't have people calling them out, you know, like this. I would imagine your ex-husband grew up with parents that just never called them out, never made him look at himself, kind of validated all his BS. Yeah. What do you think? What do all you guys think? Why are these people so arrogant? You know, it's kind of like a child. We get enamored with our own image in the mirror. Yeah, we think we're amazing. We got this new body and these new hands and fingers and we're just, oh, and we're, look at that. It's so good. What a good looking baby. Wow. You know, sometimes people need to be humbled. Sometimes somebody thinks they're so big and bad and tough until someone beats them up and shows them, no, you're not. Not that I encourage that. Just an example. I don't think that he... Uh, got called out on like that. A lot of narcissistic people will only surround themselves with, you know, useful idiots and, 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 uh, people who kiss their butt, validate them all the time. Yeah. But then they find someone, they marry someone like you, Rory, that calls them out a little bit. It doesn't work out well, I'm sure. Uh, Sir Natura I am says if someone read the DSM five, they will think they have almost all disorders. That's what I was told. Well, someone, who's that someone? Maybe, maybe there's someone out there that thinks they have 350 disorders. The truth is, is that we may all have one. That's what a lot of people say. A disorder becomes a disorder when one of our problems that we all have, problems, causes such negative effects in our life. 
maybe it's in all areas of our life. Maybe, you know, it's not just situational. It's not just because, you know, I lost my parents all at the same time. And I was just so upset and depressed for a month. Not then, not just, you know, a situation. Uh, it's all the time. It's concurrent. It's a pattern, pervasive patterns. We lose a sense of who we are in these relationships that we have where we're being abused and neglected. We don't get what we needed, what we wanted, didn't feel good. We compromised what we value. And we lose a sense of who we are and we're very susceptible to these things. We have lots of self-doubt. One of the biggest symptoms of this stuff, self-doubt. Don't know who I am. I'll listen to somebody that says I'm a bad person and I'll freak out. Oh, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I don't want to defend myself. It's like, well, then if you're not a bad person, like, who cares what they say? <laughs> um, so you look in there and you, you see all these, you know, and we're at the bad point of our life, right? We're at the lowest, lowest point of our life, maybe. And we're in a relationship where we let somebody hurt us and take advantage of us. We, we have guilt and shame. And, and maybe we, we reacted badly to it. Maybe we abused them back. Maybe we verbally abused them. And maybe we... Maybe we cheated on them too. We got so upset after so many times they cheated on us, Ugh, right? But then we read these things, oh, maybe it's me. Now, it's a very distinct criteria. These are all spectrums. You, you could have personality trait disorder or personality disorder traits, but still not have the disorder. And you could only be doing it right now. You did it once in your life, right? A couple times, not all the time. It's not who you are, yeah? You have some control over this. You can look at yourself, self-examine, introspect, say, I've got a problem and I need to get help. And maybe you can change and fix that, make it a little better. Yeah. So if, if someone, it would have to be a, a person very unstable who doesn't know who they are, very easily suggestible, easily influenced, very vulnerable. I would think they have all of them, like 350 or something. I can't remember. But I know, I, I read this because I know a lot of you guys struggle with this. And a lot of you guys had a person with severe mental illness in your life long enough. And you start to question yourself and wonder if it was me that had the person that had this mental illness. And we don't self-diagnose. So if any one of you is worried about this, concerned about this, and you want to know, then go find out from a mental health professional. And don't tell yourself. Don't look at these things and say, yep, that's me. Because that could really ruin your life. Okay. Thank you for the question. Real Rodriguez, healing family from California here. Hello. Thank you for all your thoughts. You're welcome. They give me comfort and just makes me feel better overall, always. Good. Here's another weird, creepy thing my ex-fiance would do frequently. Out of nowhere, if it was us two alone, he would try to mess with my mind, I believe. He would tell me, what if this re isn't really... Sorry. Sorry. What if this isn't reality and you're really not who you are? What if you think you're really here and you're not? What if this is just a dream and you think you're sitting here and you're really not? What if your person is just a pretend person and it's not you, etc.? I would reply to him in a calm way saying, you're trying to mess with my mind when it's really you. I'm strong-minded and I know who I am and I know I'm here. It's you. That is probably the person that is not here going crazy, trying to make me feel crazy, but right back at you because I'm strong-minded and I know who I am. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it has something to do with that. Gaslighting, trying to make you doubt yourself, feel crazy. This is how we control people emotionally. We can make them scared. We can make them doubt their own sanity. We can make them defend themselves all the time. Um, maybe these are questions that he is himself is asking. Saying, oh gosh, what if I'm not really who I am? What if I don't lose you? I mean, what you've told me about this person, I can tell you is extremely unstable and doesn't know who he is and lacks that self-awareness. And so maybe these are questions he asks himself that makes him feel scared or uncomfortable. And so he puts them onto you. Maybe putting them onto you and waiting to see what your answers are. Maybe just putting them onto you, saying, acting like I'm, I know the answers to this. I'm in control. Maybe it's a, you know, narcissistic. I, I, I do this because I look, you know, I'm philosophical. Uh, I'm very highly intelligent. I have a wide array of, of things that I think about all the time and, really philosophical things. I don't know. What do you guys think? Why do you think someone does stuff like that? Mercedes from Maine. Hello, Mercedes. Just wanted to say thank you for taking this time to answer my question. Your input is very appreciated. My question for you today is, 
Are you looking forward to the upcoming fall weather? Well, thanks for thanking me, Mercedes. And uh, no, I'm not. I live in Las Vegas this year, this summer. It's gotten up to 118. I, I know it's been hotter than that. And I love it. I love it. I wish it was at least in the 90s all year round. Night and day, too. I like that it's hot all night here. Just love it. Does it get hot? Yeah. Does it too hot? Yeah. But I can't stand cold. If it, if it takes to be 110 every day to be in the 80s at night, love it. Mm. Um, I only like summer. That's it. Spring. I would even say spring is my favorite season because that means summer's almost here. And I don't like fall. And I'm sure there's a lot of you guys like that. I think a lot of you guys, for different reasons, maybe you guys uh, dread the holidays. But, you know, winter is dark. It's cold. It's wet. I just, I can't do it. Yuck. Thanks for asking. Hello from Penrose, Colorado. Hello. When you are here, when you hear about someone going to a temple in the mountains to work on themselves like a monk, are they working on their own narcissism? I was thinking about Cat Stevens when I asked this. He gave up everything to go work on himself. I don't know. I couldn't tell you what anybody's reason is for going up there. You'd have to ask them. I think, uh, you know, going up, I don't think you need to go up onto Mount Tibet, shave your head, wear a robe, soaking wet in the cold to know who you are. There might be benefits. I've never done that. Never done it. So I couldn't, couldn't talk about it really. I bet there's some benefits, but a real journey on knowing who you are has to include other people. We're too social of animals. We don't want to be by ourselves. There's nobody truly by themselves. There's no one out living out in the woods or out in the desert all alone with no contact with humans. They're, they're not. The people that try don't make it. We need each other badly. And we can learn really who we are by interacting with other people more. I think. Just me. I think there could be some benefits, but um, I don't think all that's necessary. And I, and I, and I don't, you know, I mean, they'll, they'll go like a year without talking. Like I said, there's got to be benefits. I've never done it. I've thought about it, uh, not doing it, but I've just thought about what it's like, what they're getting out of it. And I, I, can, I think I can see some benefits. But I think that journey, I think it can't just include that if you're really trying to seek full enlightenment. You know, I, I, I think that we are always trying to become better versions of ourselves. I think maybe we're always healing from something and it never ends till we die. Never. And I think someone that may even ever reach full enlightenment, they have to, they go to bed, they wake up in the morning, they got to start over and do it again. That's what I think. So I think a lot of them are wasting their life, but that's very judgmental because I don't know. But you asked, I'm just telling you, I wouldn't do it. Emily from South Africa. Hello, Emily. How can I accept that my mom cares more about my dad's image and allowing him to abuse me than my own life? How do I stop people from arguing with me in my head? I have tried everything and it doesn't work. The second part, uh, see a mental health professional, Emily. I don't know if this is just negative self-talk or if you hear voices. I don't know exactly what that means, but seek mental help for your mental health by a professional. Okay. The first part, being an adult, the only way I know if my mom cares more about my dad's image than my own life, then I just get away from them. You don't, you don't have to be around them. Emily, there's no need, right? Um, you know, I'm, I know that's very challenging to a lot of you guys out there that believe that family is everything and blood's thicker than water. And all I got to say is blood's thicker than blood. So what? You know, that, that sounds like a slave. That sounds like some, you know, something you're holding me to or something. I don't know. But uh, we, we choose our own family and living that way has saved my life. Not my toxic mom and dad. They never saved my life. But getting away from them saved my life. So that's my suggestion, Emily. Get away from them. Heal. Get stronger. If you want to go back and have them in your life then when you're better and healthier and stronger, then do so. But it sounds like you need to get away from them. Yeah. And the second part, I, I'm sorry I can't help you. Um, if this is negative self-talk, we need to counter it with positive self-talk. It helps to talk to people and it helps to write and be as positive as we can all the time and counter these negative bad thoughts and, and find the fact to these thoughts. Do you remember talking about that? 
remember me telling you about that? But if it's more than that, Emily, then we need to, we need to seek help, okay? Uh, Stephanie from the United States of America. Do people with BPD often live in poverty? And I think that's a really good question. I don't know. I probably, maybe I could have looked up some stats on that. I'm going to have to tell you what I've seen, what I've learned, not just my personal experiences, but doing this kind of work and talking with other mental health professionals around the world. <laughs> Having a serious mental illness like borderline personality disorder called today emotionally unstable, the, the severity of this mental illness means that they're not very functional. And, it, it, and they can have troubles keeping a job. They can have troubles keeping a home and relationships with people. So on their own, I would say very much common to live in poverty. The problem is, is they're so exploitative, so parasitic, that they're usually being taken care of by someone else and not living in poverty. Living fat, living well, living good, living in the middle class range, at least. Everyone I've ever heard of. Now, the other thing I've seen often, even, is people with such mental illness like this, but they can still keep a career and make a lot of money. That's common too. I would say definitely more people with borderline have troubles holding a job, uh, finishing education, getting a career, keeping a home. I think that's, that's most. Yeah, I would say that's most. I would say people that tell me in the comment section today in this video saying, no, David, we're going to talk about it. I never live in poverty. I, you know, I live well. I have good education, good career. I take care of everything. Everything's great. Uh, if that's even true, that's definitely got to be the minority. I think a lot of people with borderline might even chime in and calm down below and say, David, I live great. What are you talking about? I do this. I do that. But actually, they're being taken care of completely like a baby. Not taking care of themselves at all. I mean, I, I just, I've heard, you know, hundreds of cases I've listened to. Hundreds. Not millions. There's millions out there. I've only heard of hundreds. Small portion. But it's so the same, always. They don't hold a job. They don't, they, they can't keep living arrangements. They're high conflict and, and, and stop and start relationships all the time with people getting all kinds of problems and they might go to jail and they don't finish anything. And, and that's, that's the reality. And then they just exploit and sponge off of and use and are parasitic and live off other people and use them and steal from them and get married and take their money and stuff like that. I think that's majority, but I couldn't know. Anybody else out there? What do you think? Do you know? You've seen any kind of stats on that? Um, I know that a lot of homeless people, a lot of drug addicts, stuff like this are borderline. Ton. Jennifer. You didn't let us know where you are. If you get a chance, tell us. Thanks. Um, so you have a question here, and I didn't understand your question, and you have a very long story afterwards. I'll, I'll try to dive into it. Hi, David. I just watched a video where you listed what you believe are the 10 worst personality traits. And you said all of those traits put someone in the range of narcissistic ASPD. These traits seem to broadly apply to the world around the disordered person. But what about when they have one target like an ex? I don't understand your question. They, they apply broadly to the world around the disordered person. I don't know what that means. It's literally them, not around them. It's them and their traits and their behaviors. And then what if they have one target like an ex? I don't know. What if they do? I don't, I, I just can't understand your question. So I, I read your example. I'll try to get into it. You're the ex, kid's father. The kid's father has been trying to take you down for 10 years. His hate has not lessened. He's easygoing, not confrontational. He started doing drugs, lost all his friends. His job allows him to turn lazy and selfish into a lifestyle. He hates the group of people he works around, but gets along with them fine. He has seething hate all the time. He won't get caught doing what he does to you when he directs the hate at you. 
The other people he hurts are his kids, but he's not thinking about them. He's just using them as a tool to hurt you. Um, he's often passive aggressive in the most shocking and twisted ways. The only other people he hurts are his kids, but he's not even thinking about them. He's just using them as a tool to hurt me. Sometimes he's delusional thinking that you're part of the mafia. The most accurate thing you found to describe this is Bill Eddy's con construct of the high conflict personality. The boy is it accurate. Is there a place for this kind of person in the DSM or ICD? Do you know this type? Please don't hold back. I know how bad this is. I live it. You're not going to freak me out. Knowledge is power. Sometimes the only thing is, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and try and guess like what mental illness he has. No. I, I'm not even a mental health professional to even be doing something like that. And a mental health professional certainly wouldn't be doing that. Shouldn't. He fits in high conflict personality type. So we know that what fits most, what is built, what makes up most of the high conflict personality type is cluster B personality disorder, histrionic, borderline, narcissistic, and antisocial. So maybe he's, he's one of them. I, I don't know. The thing is, is you're not telling me enough anyway, if I was to give some kind of accurate guess, which I won't do anyway. But if I were to, I would need much, 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 much more information, tons and tons of information. You can't just tell me one thing he does or two things he does or three things he does and say, what's his mental illness? No, a narcissist can act like that. A borderline can act like that. A sociopath can act like that. Someone with obsessive compulsive disorder can act like that. A bi someone with bipolar can act like that. Someone with paranoid personality disorder can act like that. A schizoid can act like that. Schizotypal can act like that. Seriously, a lot of them do. And I can just go on 300 40, something like that, disorders could all act like that. So I don't know. So I don't need to spend much more time. And it won't help to just keep telling me more because I'm not going to try to diagnose people. I'm just a certified professional coach. And even if I was a therapist or psychologist, I wouldn't be trying to diagnose strangers on here anyway. We, we shouldn't be doing that. He definitely has mental illness. A person that acts that way has that much hatred. But it wouldn't do any good for me to tell you which one. I, I couldn't even be accurate with the information you give me. It's not enough. And I won't try. But I appreciate your question. I understand. I've battled with that before years and years ago. I, I wanted to know what does this person have. For some reason I was like obsessed. I had to know what disorder they had. I would talk to a mental health professional. Start finding, you know, getting into a better place away from this person, start healing from this person, and then maybe they can shed some light on what they think. Thank you. Sorry I couldn't answer it for you. I'm not trying to be stubborn. It just wouldn't be right. You know, some of these questions that you guys ask me, if I were to answer them, like, what was this person thinking when they did this? And I'm like, oh, they were thinking this. Oh, they felt like this. They wanted that. I mean, how would I know? You know I would lose everything. You guys wouldn't believe anything I said after that anyway. Um, here's a sad story from Emily again. Hi, Emily in South Africa. And th I'm reading this because this is what not finding the appropriate help you need does to you. And this is very common with children. It's very sad. The scapegoat child that the, the narcissistic parents that are codependent don't want to be, you know, no one look at me. We're perfect. It must be my five-year-old's fault. My five-year-old is the only problem in this family. Everything's great. I don't know why they're acting like this. It's bizarre. I don't know why they have headaches and stomach aches, why they can't concentrate, why they're getting in trouble at school and getting bullied. I, I can't, I don't know. I know those are all symptoms of being abused at home, but we're perfect. So we're going to take the son to a doctor. Doctor's going to say something's wrong with you, get paid a ton of money to give him drugs. And then the family's happy because it's all the, the kid's fault. And then it solidifies everything damaging that the child is dealing with on their own, solidifies it. You're the problem. You're screwed. When I talked to a psychologist a long time ago, my mom turned him against me and they talked to each other behind my back. He kept saying everything was my fault and that I should kill myself and blame me for my parents abusing me. Your psychologist told you you should kill yourself. You, you should report him, Emily. I don't know, you know, I don't know what uh, psychology is like or the mental health field in South Africa is like, especially now, 
but I would still report him. That's pretty bad, and I'm really sorry. He said, my mom looks so nice, so he won't believe that she was abusing me, so it has to be me that is abusing her. So the harder I try to convince him that my parents are abusing me and lying to him, the less he, cra the less he cared and he would act like he was yawning and smile at me, like he wasn't even listening to what I was saying, patronizing. I would also talk to a psychiatrist and the psychologist would make up things about me because my mom would keep lying to him. And when I got there, he would keep blaming me and say, why did I buy a farm? And why am I keeping my mom there? And my dad was still living in a house. Uh, Emily's parents own a farm in South Africa and Aunt Emily tried to live on it with them uh, growing up and stuff. And then they convinced the therapist that Emily bought the farm and is forcing the parents to live on there. I mean, just crazy, crazy shit. Uh, my dad was still living in a house in Cape Town and then I cared and that I cared more about money than I cared about my mom and that I bought the farm and is somehow abusing my mom. Just crazy. I'm so sorry, Emily. It was all lies. My mom used money to manipulate me and keep me from getting help my whole life. Uh, even though my parents had have so much money, my parents bought the farm and all of us were staying there. She manipulated him in believing that we were still living in a house. He saw the farm we were staying on with his own eyes, but saying we weren't staying on a farm and we were staying in a house in Cape Town because that was what my mom was lying to him about. And that's who's paying him. A guy like this obviously doesn't have much business. He kept saying that my mom looked so nice and she wouldn't be able to do anything wrong. His mom probably died and he was projecting, had to fight with my mom so that she just allowed me to see a psychologist in the first place. Keeps replaying in my mind over and over again and I will do anything to make it stop. Sounds like you can actually see the truth though, at least. Now, I don't know about then. These are the kinds of things that save us when you can see what's going on. I thankfully could see what was going on growing up in my house. I didn't internalize it as much, stayed away from them. All I wanted for Christmas and birthday and for the rest of my life is just to be 18 and get the hell out of there. Didn't wait till I was 18, waited till I was 17 and left. It saved me that I could see it, understand that it was, this isn't me, this is wrong. I don't know how much you can do that, especially when they're taking you to doctors. Confirm this and validate all this gaslighting. Awful. I'm sorry, Emily. We can all heal from this. Find a better one and talk to them. Okay, you'll start having more confidence. Awful, awful. You know, I've, I've made videos about this and I think a lot of you guys have experienced this. I have, where parents just take you to doctors and that doctor just says, no, you're something wrong with you. Yeah, they'll fix it though. Just drug them up. Don't fix the problem and then just blame them. Crazy. And just keep that going. Keep them on drugs for eight years. S drug, drug the scapegoat. Victoria from the Bay Area. Have you heard of Coco the Gorilla? Yes, that was taught sign language. Yes, she was given a kitten and after a while she started to teach the kitten sign language. Very interesting documentary. She was able to tell the lady how her babies were killed by hunters. I remember that. That was a long time ago. We could so much, we could learn so much from her. Unfortunately, this is the way. Do you have an opinion on this experiment? I find it very interesting. Um, I believe in evolution. I studied it. It's very interesting to me. I study it a lot. Um, there's reasons that there were many other species of human beings that aren't here today and we're the only ones. As violent as we are, I think we can all guess what happened to the rest of them. We freak out even if we have different pigment in our skin. Still can't get over that. People still can't. We still can't except fully if we have different shades of color of our skin and you've got the one side that thinks they're so great they won't stop talking about it everything is about race today on the news everything's about race everything bizarre um and we evolved different things sparked our evolution you know, we learned how to build fire and then that made us stay up at night and start dreaming and thinking and communicating more we're able to walk on two legs and we're able to start using our hands and carry things and using, making tools. So things, different things spark our evolutionary process, our big jumps and leaps. 
we are doing that to other animals for sure we're doing that to dogs they're saying now that dogs are gonna are starting to communicate with humans more maybe someday they'll be able to communicate with us very well um but it's interesting yeah i don't know if that applies to any of this um I don't think in the in nature a gorilla would have an opportunity to learn sign language from human from another animal and teach another animal sign language. Very interesting. Yeah, I don't think we're that different, guys. I know a lot of people, especially religious people, think that there are human beings and then there's animals, and I don't understand the difference. And anybody who ignores evolution, I I, I don't know what to say about that. It must be very confusing. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I don't know what else to. I don't know their opinion. If you had another question about that, you want to know from me, please ask me. Thanks for sharing that, Victoria. Uh, Rose, hello, Rose. Hi, David. Why do you? Why do they talk so much? I say they. I can't really put a name to the disorder, BPD maybe. But forever on the phone, talking to work, arranging, making decisions for who's doing what. On the other hand, I'm tired just listening. I get overwhelmed and want to withdraw. It's awful, isn't it? I can't stand it. When someone just won't shut up. And this this is not exclusive to any kind of mental disorder, illness. These are people that talk too much. My son and then my daughter and then my dog and then my, and then my life and then when I was a kid and I went like this and then they start telling you the same stories over and over again. They never stop and then they ask you a question don't give you a chance to respond. And when you start talking, they talk over you. Oh, yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they cut you off and then they hijack and you all you have to say is, oh, I was going to the beach with my dad one day. Oh, yeah, me too. I went to the beach with my dad. Blah, 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 blah. And you got to sit and wait for them to talk and finish the story for five minutes so you can start to tell your story again. And then when you go back to it, they cut you off again. And then when you go back to it, now they're walking away not paying attention and they don't get care less what you had to say. You mean like that? Isn't that just disgusting? It's trauma. It's people who have been traumatized, neglected, severely neglected, abused growing up, severely traumatized, won't get better, won't calm themselves down. Everything's exciting. Everything's whoa, 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 no matter what you say. And they never feel like they're being heard or understood. That's why they never shut up. The only way I can get you to understand is to tell you, right? And if it's very complex and it's hard to understand and I'm not very good at communicating, I need to tell you and keep telling you and telling you and telling you and telling you. And I need to keep just talking about this goddamn stupid story forever. And then bring it up again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Get help. And when people do this, get away from them. I can't stand it. I can't. People need to shut up and stop talking so much and telling people so much. I'll meet people that just, it's amazing. I'll meet someone. And they'll just give you all the information of their entire life all at once. And you'll say, hey, that's too much. Stop. And they'll, oh, no, it's okay. I'm just an open book. <laughs> Shut the book. Shut up. Biggest advice on this channel. Stop telling people shit. Stop telling them so much. Stop giving people so much information about you. Why? If you need to talk to someone, go pay to talk to someone. And what's hilarious is when you see like a therapist is like this. Yeah, they, their job is to talk to people and listen to people, but all they do is talk, 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 talk. You wonder what the clients are doing. Just sitting there listening to them and validating all their BS. Amazing. And then they'll go back to them. Yeah. And it's absolutely draining. Sucks you dry of energy. Just exhausted. Just, uh, what? Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. Really? Okay. Wow. Uh-huh. Really? Okay. Uh-huh. 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 And I'm, I, you know, I'm a polite person and I want to make eye contact with people when they're talking and I want to listen and not interrupt them. So you just sit there and you just stare in their freaking eyes forever and just, mm-hmm, yeah, mm, okay, mm-hmm, yeah, mm, okay, mm-hmm, uh, uh, okay. Can you, and, and that's what they want. That's what they want. They want you to just sit there and stare at them undivided attention nonstop and listen and listen and listen and listen and listen. It's almost like I'm dealing with that today. I'm so upset about it. Huh? Yeah. Why do they talk so much? Because they think nobody listens. Because they think nobody understands. Because they think and they're used to nobody giving a solid shit about them or what they have to say. That's why. <laughs> Best communicator is someone who can listen. 
Ben, here's Ben. Ben from Florida, if I remember right. Your question I missed last week. I'm sorry I missed your question. Thank you for telling me. Yep, Ben from Florida again. Thank you for answering my last question. You're welcome. And you know what, Ben? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back. You wrote it again here. But this one's a little bit more information than your original. At my current job, my boss, who is the owner of the company, has started to take a special interest in me. Due to us having similar interests, she is married and will text me while I'm not at work and we talk about non-work topics. She has invited me to church with her and her husband. I went due to me feeling obligated after she gave me money, knowing I'm in a really bad financial situation. I just feel really uncomfortable about all of this. Those are boundaries. It's not romantic by any means, but the text messages and off work text messages just seem weird. Any advice would be welcome. Thank you, David. I just constantly encounter married women who passively show an inappropriate interest in me. Okay, well then there's a vulnerability, right? We have an influencer and a vulnerability. The influencer is a married woman. The vulnerability is what? What is that? Something for you to find out. It's good to know our vulnerabilities. Why are we vulnerable to that? Um, so you're, you're right. Yeah, maybe it's innocent on her part. Yeah. Maybe it's not. All that matters is how you feel, Ben. It's uncomfortable. And so let's not let ourselves be uncomfortable anymore. Okay? So... If you want this to stop, we got to find a ways to stop. And then we got to own a part of this so we know what we can change and avoid next time. Can you think of something that maybe you shouldn't do next time? I wouldn't borrow money from coworkers. And now you feel obliged. You're not. You're not obligated. Whatever the terms were on that loan is it. Nothing more. Nothing more than you agreed upon, but I understand. I get it. She might just be socially awkward. You know, maybe she's socially awkward. It's a weird thing that she's texting you while you're not at work and she's married. That just doesn't make sense. I don't know why. She doesn't know you. What does she tell her husband? We're friends. Just met. We're coworkers. So what? Why are you texting him? Why is he going to church with us? Bizarre, Ben. I, may, maybe you're not aware of how much you look like you really need help, man. Nothing wrong, nothing bad against you. Maybe you look like you're suffering. Maybe there's things you say and, and the way you're acting and, and really need help. And she's somebody that just really wants to help you, Ben. You know, I don't know. That's not your question. Um, you just want any advice I can give. If it makes us uncomfortable, the best you will feel is to make that less uncomfortable, to make it more comfortable, to stop that, to, to go down. And so we find a way to do that. If we're not used to doing this, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be awkward. It might even be scary. But if you do it anyway, it gets really, really easy. Next time it'll be a lot easier. And we, we've got to. We've got to have better boundaries, I think. Right, then. Always could have better boundaries. Uh... I would not answer the text back. And then when you see her, say, yeah, I read your text, but it was a little late last night. And, you know, we don't want to lie. But I just don't know if it's okay. I don't feel comfortable texting you back because you're married. And she says, oh, it's okay. Me and my husband say, I understand. Just block all that out. None of that matters. And say, it's okay. I'm uncomfortable. I'm not okay with it. And we don't have to explain ourselves. We don't have to defend ourselves. We just stick to it because that's enough. How you feel is enough, Ben. And if it's not enough to her or to someone else, screw them. We don't start explaining and giving. We just say, well, that's just the way it is. No. It's just uncomfortable. I don't like texting you. You're married. We're coworkers. We should really just be talking about work stuff and why not just keep work at work? I don't want to keep, I don't want to talk about work stuff when I'm at home at night. I go to work to make money, not friends. A lot of people don't have friends. And they try to make friends at work. It doesn't work out very well. Stay away from them. Yeah. I don't know what she's doing. It is weird. Makes me feel weird. 
I bet you feel weird. And so stop doing it then. That's the simple answer. I'm not saying it's simple to do. But the simple answer, Ben, stop texting her. Don't go anywhere with her anymore. Pay her back as fast as you can at any means necessary. Give her that money back and say, let's just keep it at work. Right? I don't like texting a married woman. That's reasonable. I wouldn't. And if she doesn't, if she thinks, if she tries to say, well, it's okay, she doesn't understand. It's not okay to you gives a shit if it's okay to her, right? I mean, if you're trying to text her and she doesn't, she says, no, it's not okay, I'm married. Yeah, okay, but for her to say, oh no, it's okay to text me even though you don't like it. It's okay to text me even though it makes you uncomfortable. Keep texting me. Yeah, that's toxic, yeah. The whole thing's weird. She doesn't need to text you off of work about non-work related stuff. It, it makes me think she doesn't have a life and you could not have a life even though you're married and go to church. Doesn't mean you have a life. But all that matters is it makes you feel uncomfortable. Just tell her that. That simple. Nah, it makes me feel a little uncomfortable. You, you can say like, it ah, makes me feel a little uncomfortable to text you back. I, I, I'd rather just talk at work about work stuff. Well, why? Why what? Well, why does it make you uncomfortable? Because we're coworkers. We should really just be talking about work. And you're married. You can throw it into it like, well, I wouldn't talk to people if I was married. And so I'm not going to talk to other married people when they're married. Kind of throw that in her face and let her know that what she's doing is maybe not that great. You know, I don't know how it's going to help her. I don't know how it's going to help her marriage. <clears throat> but all that matters is that it's uncomfortable to you, Ben. And that's enough, isn't it? It's uncomfortable to us. So I'm not going to do it. You know, when someone says, David, why won't you do it? I don't want to. Well, David, why not? No, I just said, I don't want to. That's enough. That's who I am. What I want. I don't need to, or I need this. That's why I'm asking for you to reassure me because I need reassurance. I need it. Well, I think that you're just, a, okay, fine. Great. You know, makes me feel bad. I don't want to do it because it feels bad. Well, come on, do it anyway. It's weird, right? It's like poking me with a needle. I tell you it feels bad. You just keep doing it. I tell you, I don't want to do that. It feels bad. You tell me to do it anyway. Weird. People are weird. I hope you guys respect other people's boundaries, at least, even if people don't respect yours. That's it, guys. That's all the questions. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your questions and your support. Please consider thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. Let's get that 10% up to 50 at least. Can, I, can half of you support me? If you like this video, if you think it's benefiting you in any way. I'd imagine so, since people keep watching it every week. Thank you. Love yourself first, guys. I'll see you next week, okay? Bye-bye.